Bert Rains, author, bird watcher, conservation activist, oh, and curmudgeon too, next on Wyoming Chronicle. If you've read the long-running columns by Burt Raines in the Jackson Hole News, you know him as an observant bird watcher, a campaigner for wildlife protection, and a poet in prose writing about the outdoors. He won the Rungius Award for Conservation, along with Wallace Stegner and Marty Murray, and with his late wife Meg, he set up a foundation to fund wildlife studies. Maybe you didn't know he was a city kid from New Jersey, or that he got a degree in chemical engineering and worked for a big corporation in Cleveland. Now in his 80s, Reigns is not as light a foot as he once was, but his mind is as nimble as ever. In this interview with Wyoming Chronicle's John Kerr, he talks about wildlife and his life. So Bert Reigns, welcome thank to you, Wyoming John. Chronicle, and thanks for joining us here thank today. Thank you, John, very much. I want to go right to the heart of it and learn how a city kid from Jersey City gets to Wyoming and wins the Rungus Award for, Converse, uh, for Conservation, and joins Wallace Stegner and Marty Murray and E.O. Wilson and the Craigheads and Jane Goodall. And how does that same kid get here and win the Wyoming Outdoor Hall of Fame Award with Teddy Roosevelt? And on and on. How did this happen, Bert? I think I can only answer the first part of your question, which was how did I get here? I read a lot of books when I was a kid, and I read about the West because I grew up in a very urbanized setting with no nature at all to speak of it. Uh, literally, literally true. And always wanted to see the West. Then I got lucky, and I met my future wife, who was from a semi-rural se setting in Pennsylvania. And she showed me some of nature. And then I had that professor that changed my life, who t told everybody who would listen at the time that natural resources are finite. Who was that professor? Uh, Black Mike Cannon, his name was. Where was he? Where was Penn he? Penn State Uni uh, College in those days. Penn State College. Penn State College. That's where you went. Yeah. And what did he tell you? What did he teach you? He, that, that there are natural resources, but there w are limits to them. They will not last forever. Hmm. And we should all conserve and use the resources wisely. That had a big impact on all those things did. Did you ever tell him so? I went back, actually my wife was invited back to to Penn State <clears throat> and she had all these conferences and things and I took the time to see my old school and I did tell Black Mike huh. and i am always been grateful that I did because he died very young. It was a great loss. and. After World War II, first chance we got, Meg and I took an automobile trip out here and went to Jackson Hall because I'd read about the Craigheads and read about the Murrays and read about Jackson Hall. And we got enchanted. And that's how I came here. As for getting these awards, I have no idea. I think they were desperate. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Rungus, let's be clear about that from my point of view at least, the Rungus Award for Conservation, nothing desperate about it. As I said, Wallace Stegner, Marty Murray, E.O. Wilson, the Craigheads, Jane Goodall, and on and on. This award that's on the table right here, I'll spin it, is from the, the Heritage, the Wildlife Heritage Foundation. Of and it's to b both Meg and me, which is why I'm very fond of it, because lots of times just the guy gets the credit or the woman gets the credit, not the person who's back in the background doing all the work. Well, one of the people who got this was Teddy Roosevelt, speaking of guys. Who yeah. Got, so you're joining some quite a quite He a wasn't crowd. too shabby. No. <laughs> and neither are you, Bert. Um, talk to me a little bit about um, 
about Meg's influence in, in your life. You've lost Meg now, yep. but um, Meg's with you every day and yep. goes on. You're still partners in a sense. Tell yes. me about that. Well, we met as students, freshmen in college. And uh, we didn't get along at first, and then we started to talk, and we never finished talking. Hmm. So her influence was constant. What was her influence? Uh, you've become a leader in conservation. Um, you're, you're modest about it. Um, you're sometimes even grumpy about it. But you have. and and. What was her influence in all this? This is, by the way, a picture that you have in your house that you've let us, of you and Meg. Tell us about it. Oh, that was in 73, and we had moved here permanently instead of coming out every year <coughs> for several weeks. And we had invited a friend who took the picture because he wanted to see how we were doing. You know, we were from the East. And this was the Wild West. And in uh, 1973, it was a lot different uh, than the society is now. We have fresh fruit now, and fish come into markets, things like that. All kinds Almost of Almost civilized here. Take me back to, um, you said you went to Penn State. Yeah. And where did you go then? What did you do then, Bert? How My did first real job was in Schenectady, New York for the great General Electric Company Research Laboratory, where I was the baby of the laboratory. And the baby of the laboratory gets shown around the lab by the outgoing baby of the laboratory, so you get to meet some really wonderful people that you might not otherwise meet, really top figures in science. And uh, we went, after five years, uh, we went to Cleveland, Ohio, the outskirts of Cleveland, and I got hooked on research, so I worked for two small independent research companies, which gave me a chance to work in a variety of fields, which I enjoyed. What were those companies? RAND Development and uh, Horizons Incorporated. And at RAND, at RAND Development, what did you do? Well, I had been offered an opportunity to work on pollution control research if I could just get the finances for it. You know, I was given a position, go out and do something. And I was lucky, and also I worked hard, but luck has had a lot to do with all these things. Um, worked on mostly water pollution control, trying to improve their existing processes or invent new ones. Now, I took a look at the, at the, at the website and it says you were vice president for applied research and you worked in pollution abatement. Yeah. Um, you were in Ohio, in Cleveland. Yeah. What was going on with waterways and riverways and stuff like that there? You must have been right in the thick of it. The waters of our country had begun to stink. Hmm. And they've been cleaned up some in all these years. That was in the 60s but there's still 40% of our waters are polluted to one extent or another. Lake Erie, in particular, in the fall, was getting so that the water supply for the whole Cleveland area was not potable. Hmm. You couldn't stand the smell hmm. or to drink it. And what did you do about that? Well, I didn't do very much about the Lake Erie thing, but I tried to improve sewage treatment plant costs and efficiencies. How? Well, in that particular one was um, a better use and disposal of the sewage sludge 
that results from one of the major, the major water, uh, sewage treatment processes in the country, uh, most of the world actually, by pipelining it to uh, away and using the material to reclaim strip mine areas and other areas that need fertilizer because so, it's a great so, fertilizer. So per poop for purpose or poop for profit? I never had thought of that at that time. Too bad you didn't patent that. Uh, where were you when I <laughs> needed you? <laughs> What's this picture here? This was in your this was in your folder. This is uh, this is a couple of well, this was a process devils. using coal as a medium to remove impurities from sewage. Is this you right here? I'm a, that is I. And who is this fellow right here? Young Stuart Udall. Stuart Udall, the Secretary of Interior? Secretary of the Interior. And what's this gizmo? Oh, just some gauges that we had. I couldn't tell you precisely anymore what they are. What were you doing here? We were showing off a, a filtering process that used coal that was on its way to be burned for energy to remove impurities from sewage hmm. and say, may, you know, make a cost savings there. And also was happened to be very good for removal of phosphorus, which is a big problem in sewage treatment effluent hmm. because it's a good fertilizer. And you, the effluent goes into some receiving water, a stream or a lake, and if you have too many pollutants, too many goodies for things to grow that you don't want to grow, they'll grow. And so, let me get this straight. That sort of thing is what we were doing. You came from Jersey City, New Jersey. Yeah. You came west, but in the way west you stopped at Penn State and you stopped at Union College. You stopped in Cleveland. I don't know what took me so long. I wasn't too bright. Ha! <laughs> and you worked, and you worked in, in sort of conservation, but in engineering. Yeah. How did you go from there, Bert, to becoming uh, what I think of, and most of us in your newly adopted, so not your newly adopted state, you're in, here in the West, as one of the leading conservationists of our times. How did that happen? Well, I don't know that I can go along with that characterization, but I've been writing and talking about the need for pollution control, the need to retain some wildness in our lives. The Once you learn about the uh, therapeutic value of a natural area with wild things in it, you can't take that out of your mind. And I've tried to teach other people that. And uh, some of it through bird watching. Uh, I've ruined a lot of lives and turned people into bird watchers. You were the founder or are the founder of the Jackson Hole Bird Club. Yeah. What's that been like? Along with another fella. Who else? Reverend Dan Abrams, hmm. who uh, lives in Montana now. Hmm. <coughs> when you come into Jackson, from the north, there's a, at the, near the visitor center, there's a, there's a place there where you can see the water birds and so forth. I noticed that it's called Bert's Walk. Is that after you? Yeah, it's me. <laughs> a Bert Walk, yeah. A Bert Walk. And out on the National Refuge is two trees protected by a big fence that are planted in honor of Meg. Oh, how wonderful. Where are they? You can see them from the new, uh, the new, the uh, National Museum of Wildlife Art of the United States. There you go. It's uh, right adjacent to the path that the sleigh rides go. Oh yeah. Across Flat Creek to show people the elk in the winter time. You're quite an author. Birds of Grand Teton, Valley So Sweet, Curmudgeon Chronicles, Winter Wings. Anything else? Finding the Birds of Jackson Hole. Quite an effort. Piece of cake. Piece of cake. <laughs> but you've really, you've really influenced, uh, so far, a lot of lives, and you're influencing a lot right now. I, uh, I noticed that in the, uh, 
Fourth of July parade in Jackson, <laughs> that there was a certain fella right here sitting in the back of this old truck with the sign Bert. And I understand that as you were driven through the town, uh, much in the way people were tarred and feathers, feathered in other times, <laughs> you were treated to applause and to Bert, Bert, Bert. And you're entirely responsible too. That's well, your truck is, and you're driving it. I have a, I, in, the, in the spirit of full disclosure, I have to tell you that this is my truck and uh, I invited you to do it and um, you said not a chance in Hades, which I took as a yes and it was quite a day. You're a persuasive young man. <laughs> Bert, um, where does the inspiration come from that you found and that others are finding to um, be stewards for this vast and wonderful wild land and for creatures that can't speak for themselves? Where does it come from for you? Well, I, I don't think it's inspiration or what is it? I think it's just a recognition that came to me fortunately when I was in college, that things needed to be done and perhaps I could do one or two of them and I would give it a try, so I still give it a try. Hmm. We're still trying to get people involved, people to understand their, their involvement, why they're involved, and get the enthusiasm for maintaining what we can of our planet. Hmm. Uh, there's a lot of floose talk about how we're going to, uh, not the word popularize, I mean establish popula populations on other planets. <laughs> well, I wouldn't hold my particular breath, especially at my age, not even at your age. It's a long way off and it will be just a few of us, not nine billion that they're predicting in a short time. So this is what we have. And um, those astronaut boys, when they showed the picture of the Earth rise over the moon and that little blue dot, mm -hmm. you had to be impressed. Yeah. You do it humble too. Awful thin layer that we're support, we're dependent on around the earth. If you're just joining us on Wyoming Chronicle, I'm speaking with Bert Rains, who's a conservationist and columnist and self-described curmudgeon, an outspoken and indefatigable teller of the truth as he sees it, and a defender of our planet. May I correct you? Okay. The, word, the title curmudgeon was given to me by the, author, by the publisher of that book. Oh, it was? I would not have chosen that. But what about the title of SOB? I might have chosen SOB. Tell us about that. Well, I've always assumed that whenever anybody called me an SOB, they meant sweet old Bert. <laughs> so I've gone with that. Uh, well, sweet old Bert. Sweet old Bert. I don't know. So what keeps you going? What keeps the what keeps the gleam in your eye? You've got limited mobility now. Yeah. Um, you've lost your life partner. Yeah. Um, you've spent some time thinking while looking at a hospital ceiling. Um, what keeps you going? What role do your friends play? What what keeps the spark in the, those eyes of yours? Well, we've been very lucky to have wonderful friends, and a lot of them, including you, sir. Thank you. Well, I'm honored to be your friend. Tell I'm me about delighted. the Burt Rains, the, the, the Meg and Burt Rains Wildlife Fund. What's it about? Well, uh, we recognized, Meg and I, when we used to talk about these things, that the uh, government, the federal and state and local authorities have limited resources to measure and determine uh, the, the wildlife 
distribution and occurrence locally. <laughs> there just aren't that many eyes. But if we could enlist all the citizens, the citizen science um, motive, to turn in their reports of what they see just outside their, in their backyard or in the back country, and we could collate and make all those things available. The managers who have to manage wildlife, the planners who have to plan our development and our traffic patterns and uh, transportation, all those things. If they had more data, they could perhaps, we hope, make better decisions. Hmm. And so we started this fund uh, to uh, ask people to turn in their observations. We started with one day when people were asked to tell us what moose they saw, where they saw it, or them, and what the sexes were, which is reasonably easy with moose. And that seemed to be a big success. Game and fish people seemed to enjoy having that additional data. And then we had a uh, five-week program up the Grovant Mountains to watch antelope, elk, bighorn sheep, wolves, mountain lion if they happen to come, and whatever came. And now we're, we're not doing this all on ourselves. We're doing this in partnership with other organizations like the Wildlife Foundation um, with the Teton Science Schools with the Game and Fish Department, with the Forest Department, U.S. Forest Service. How are, how, are, how are young people and how are some of the retired folks and others involved in this? Well, if they know how to use this newfangled computer stuff, <laughs> we're trying to make it as simple as we can. And if they don't, will a piece of paper work? Yeah, or even a telephone call. Hmm. So I just want to get this straight. So, so, so what you've done is you have with your, with your own um, uh, savings, your own resources, funded um, this effort that is intended, as I'm understanding you, to um, give us a better idea of the wildlife and the natural features that surround us and sustain us. Am I right? Yeah. And that'll and go on after your lifetime. I certainly... That's our intention, yes. Wow, what a contribution. Well, we've had a lot of help. And how many people is it involved so far? Well, the immediate folks on the advisors and so forth, there's about seven, hmm. mostly biologists. Core, core group. Core group. And then how many people total do you think have been mixed up in this so far? Well, I think they've trained and I have to say they, because I'm not doing very much of the work, I'm afraid. Uh, 58 people who are regular. Hmm. We've had, for example, we have a pica project going in the valley and in the surrounding area, along with the Teton Science Schools. And uh, 150 sites were identified with GPSs and mapping stuff um, <laughs> in the first two months. Wow. Now this includes some sites that were known about, but we didn't have identified until... Well, uh, and to say nothing of the thousands of people who read your weekly column in the paper, um, time is running short on us, as it always does. Uh, I want to show one thing here. This is a pen that has Lyndon Johnson's signature on the outside of the box, maybe on the pen. What was this pen used for, Bert? We've only got a little time. It was one of those pens you see presidents signing their names on abruptly. Obama is doing it very carefully now. What was this for? Uh, he was signing bills that included some water pollution control money. That you were involved in. And I was involved in that, yeah. 
Wow. So you have taken your early life, your partnership with Meg, your time in an urban area, you've come west, and you have inspired thousands, maybe tens of thousands, and you're modest about it. You got the name curmudgeon, you're a sweet old bird, SOB, and looks to me like you're gonna probably do some more damage before you're done. What's ahead for you? Oh, keep on keeping, oh, I'm working on a couple of books. Really? And, uh... <laughs> you gonna cause some more trouble? Oh, I hope so. I hope so, too. I hope so. I love talking with you. Thank you for coming in and joining us on Wyoming Chronicle. Thank and you. And good sir. luck to you, and hats off to you. I checked out the website of the Meg and Burt Rains Wildlife Fund and was pleased to find a project devoted to one of my favorite creatures, the pika, a small rodent you'll hear peeping among the boulders high in the Rockies. The project maps the location of pikas based on observations reported by people like you and me, so keep your eyes open. The people and stories we cover on Wyoming Chronicle are larger than we can fit into our half-hour format. We hope we've just whet your appetite and you'll dig deeper, reading the books, listening to the music, and debating the issues that we cover here. If you want to go further down the path with interesting people like Burt Rains, visit our website at wyomingpbs.org and go to the Wyoming Chronicle page. Make us a habit. The Wyoming Chronicle doesn't end when this half hour does. It continues on our website, wyomingpbs.org, where with your help, we'll begin an ongoing dialogue around the topics we discuss on the air. Share your experiences and tell us what you think and while you're at it, throw some ideas at us for future topics and guests.